everybody, welcome back to the ECG channel. Today we have a really fun EKG that we're going to kind of deep dive into and break down. If you want to follow along with this document, the link in my description will take you to the Patreon where you can join for free and download all the PDFs for all hundreds of the lectures that I've got. So I'm excited to have you all here, join the community, and let's jump into this EKG. So first thing we're going to do is look at the forest and get an idea of what's going on with this rhythm. And so we're going to look maybe in lead V5, and I notice I've got a narrow complex rhythm seems to beat along at somewhat of a normal rate. I, I have these pauses. I see a pause here. I also see a pause here. So a couple of pauses, but outside of the pauses, the rhythm seems to be somewhat regular throughout. If I look in front of those beats, I see maybe some atrial activity. I would look maybe here's a P wave, here's a P wave. P waves seem to be far away from the QRSs. We'll kind of figure that out, but the QRS complexes are narrow. My QRS is less than 120 milliseconds within three small boxes. And what that tells me is that it's using the Hisperkinji system to depolarize the atria. So I know that this rhythm at least is originating from the AV node and traveling through my Hisperkinji fibers down to the ventricle. So likely some type of atrial or at least junctional or higher rhythm and we're gonna figure that out. So let's take a look at what the atria is doing. Like we said, we do have some good atrial activity we can visualize here in V1. I like V1 because usually the T waves of the QRSs are pretty flat, so the little short spiky P waves, we can really get a good idea of where they are. And so here in V1, you see I've got P waves. You can see those spiky P waves. See one there. And those P waves, if I look, they are upright in lead one. Here's lead one, upright in lead one. In AVF, I would say, kind of isoelectric, but at least seems to be upright or isoelectric in AVF. If they were isoelectric with AVF, that means the P wave axis would be somewhere in that direction, which is, I would say, normal with a sinus rhythm. If you wanted to even get more data on this sinus rhythm, you can even get the P wave rate, which this P to maybe this P is 300, 150, 100. This would be 75. So the P wave rate is like 80, which is normal for sinus node. Um, the rate of this EKG, you can tell between the, the QRSs that are not dropping, you can see we have 300, 150, 100, 75, maybe 80 beats per minute, right? So pretty normal rate here, something that would make sense with a sinus rhythm or sinus rate. Let's take a look at what the AV node is doing. And the first thing when I think of what the, what's the AV node doing, I'm going to measure my PR interval because that's the time it takes from that P wave to get down to the QRS, which is the time that the AV node holds on to that rhythm or that signal. And here I have something called group beating. And you, you might have noticed this in, in number 160 in the, in the previous EKG video. We also had group beating. And these are going to be two different examples of group beating. This is why I put them back to back. So if you haven't watched that video, go check it out. It's a really um, interesting one. You'll be able to compare and contrast. But what you'll notice here is we have these groups of beats, right? Here's a group, here's a group, and here's a group. And remember we said that group beating can be one of really two things. It could be a second degree AV block. Remember, second degree means that some P waves make it to the QRS and um, maybe a handful don't, right? Not all of them do, not all of them don't. Or it could be like a bigeminy, where you have every other beat is something. We don't have bigeminy here, um, but what we do have is we look at our initial PR intervals, and maybe I'll use V1. You can see the PR interval, at the beginning of my P, beginning of my QRS, you can see it's already prolonged. That's probably, I'm just gonna eyeball it, maybe eight millimeters, eight small boxes. We know that each small box is 40 milliseconds, so I gotta do math on the camera. That's the PR interval is 320 milliseconds. Um, I actually don't measure these things out before the video, so I do. I am doing the math on the videos. So um, if I mess something up, it's, it's probably why. So PR interval initially is 320 milliseconds, and what we'll then do is measure out the next, because I'm really curious if this is a second degree AV block or not. And so you can see that this next PR interval looks a little bit longer. It's probably an extra small box. So that would be 360 milliseconds. And then this next PR interval from the beginning of that P, beginning of the QRS, that's like 12 little boxes. And so that's, what is that? 480 milliseconds. And then this last P, 
which is right there, and that P wave has no QRS, it's blocked. So what kind of block occurs at the AV node when the PR interval gets worse and worse and worse and worse until it drops? This is a second degree AV block type one or Winky block, right? So we've got a second degree type one AV block and you can look at the rest, it resets. So after that blocked uh, P wave, it resets and you have this P go to the QRS and then this P goes to the QRS, it takes a little longer, a little longer, a little longer. And then we have another drop. So this is all characteristic of a type one AV block. And remember, it's important to discern between type one and type two because type one, this is called decremental conduction and decremental, decremental, I don't think I spelled that right, conduction. The AV node has decremental conduction. We all have decremental conduction in our AV node. If our heart beats really fast compared to what it's beating right now, our PR intervals are all gonna just lengthen a little bit. We're not gonna really drop beats, but it's gonna lengthen a little bit. When, when the AV node gets diseased, like you see here in this EKG, it happens that we see decremental conduction at baseline, right? So this tells me that we have disease of the AV node proper, right? Secondary type one is of the AV node proper. That's important because if this block gets worse, it's okay because if it gets worse and it completely blocks here and we develop a third degree AV block with type one features that developed into a third degree, we still have this junction region right here, these his bundles for an escape rhythm. So we can still generate an escape rhythm if these blocks get worse. That's why these people don't need emergency pacemakers. Whereas a type two second degree AV block is actually a block of these fibers. And if that gets worse, they have no escape rhythm outside of a ventricular escape, which might be you know, 20 to 40 milliseconds, might be too slow. So those people actually get uh, pacemakers a lot quicker. So, all right, so we said we've got a second degree type one AV block here, a sinus rhythm. Um, let's take a look at our QRS morphology. We said it was narrow, less than 120 milliseconds. The axis of our QRS is upright in lead one, but down going in AVF, so it's kind of going up and to the left. And let's figure out how far up and to the left. It's negative in lead two. So if it's negative in lead two, here's lead two. If it's, if it's negative in lead two, that means it's going away from lead two and it's going towards AVL. So we've got an axis that's going this direction. We would call this left axis deviation. So we have left axis deviation because it's farther than AVL, which is negative 30 degrees. So we've got left axis deviation. Well, what can cause left axis deviation? We need to kind of develop a differential diagnosis for this. We could have left ventricular hypertrophy. We could have fascicular blocks, right? Like a left anterior fascicular block. We have um, bundle branch blocks. It could be an ectopy beat. We know it's not ectopy because we see we have AV conduction. But when I look at this morphology, you see in lead one, I've got this morphology that's a little q, big R. So we've got little q, big R in lead one. And in lead three, we've got little r, big S. Little r, big S. And if you put these together, this is left anterior fascicular block, right? Remember that the left bundle, the left bundle has two fascicles that come off of it, right? So if I look at my left bundle, we have the left posterior fascicle, which say branches kind of posterior septal, right? That's kind of running a posterior aspect of the septum. That's the left posterior fascicle. So this is the left posterior fascicle. And left anterior fascicle, if you imagine that I'm gonna draw out of the screen anterior, the left anterior fascicle kind of comes out along kind of this anterior lateral wall. That's the left anterior fascicle. And so what ends up happening is if the left anterior fascicle gets blocked and it doesn't work, well then we get ventricular activation uh, in the left ventricle via the left posterior fascicle. And these are running endocardially, so you get the initial wave of deflection off of the left posterior fascicle in the left ventricle goes in this direction because it's going from endocardium to epicardium. And that produces a little Q wave in lead one because it's going away. And it produces a little R wave in lead three because it's going towards it, but it's little because it's just a little bit of force. And then the rest of the ventricles activate from cell to cell heading the opposite direction. And so we end up getting 
in lead one, a big R because it's heading towards there. And then in lead three, you end up getting this deep S wave because it's heading away from lead three. So that's the left anterior fascicular block. But then something else that uh, I noticed is that I'm gonna also evaluate for hypertrophy. There might be hypertrophy. I'm not a huge fan of hypertrophy on EKGs, um, unless it's really obvious. Um, just because there's so many things, obesity, pulmonary disease, just body habitus that can change the amplitude or QRS morphology. However, here we do see that our AVL does have a baseline QRS amplitude of 5, 10, 15, maybe 17 millimeters. And I, I'm pretty sure LVH is greater than 11 millimeters in AVL. So you might say that there's some, some signs of LVH as well. Okay, so there's our QRS morphology. Let's take a look at the QT interval. I'll just go between two of these R to R's. I'll go midway, and I'll see if my T wave ends at least by the midway point, which it does, so my QT looks good. Um, next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna look for pathological Q waves, and someone that's got a left anterior fascicular block, left ventricular hypertrophy, you know, the, it seems like they in, in an AV block, they probably are at a high risk for some chronic um, vascular disease, you know, who knows, so they might have some pathological Q waves. And what I notice is that V1 seems to have these pathological Q waves, right? V1, we really just have just Qs, just Qs. So it looks like we've got some pathological Q waves in V1. You can see even V2 has got a little bit of a, a just a, just a weird morphology. It doesn't, it's not doing right. And you can see that we have R waves, these R waves that don't really progress the way that we would like for them to progress. And so maybe a prior septal infarct that was kind of developed into this pathological Q wave that also, maybe when they had this septal infarct, took out kind of that branch of the left anterior fascicle as it was exiting near the septum. So, you know, it could put this all together. Um, uh, look for ST and T wave changes, I don't see any. And so let's put this all together. What do we get? We have a sinus rhythm at a rate of around 80 beats per minute. We've got a second degree type one AV block. We have a left anterior fascicular block. We've got maybe a little bit of LVH. And we've got these septal pathological Q waves. And pathological Q waves, remember, are pretty specific. They're not very sensitive, but when they are present are very specific for an MI in that region. So I think all of this adds up. Um, and yeah, that's it all. So if you have any questions about this EKG, feel free to throw it down in the comments. Uh, if not, thanks so much for watching. The best way to support the channel, if you enjoy the channel, is to subscribe, to interact, um, and build a community. So thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you on the next EKG video. Have a great day.